Hello and welcome to the Fave English Podcast, your one-stop shop for Venezuelan football in English, bringing you fortnightly episodes dedicated to the Venezuelan league, the national teams and the myriad of Venezuelan players around the world. Today we will be reviewing the first half of the season with the Liga Fave campaign just over the midpoint in the regular season, 17 games into the 30 that will precede the championship round contested by the top four and the Sudamericana playoff contested by the next eight. And joining me today is my regular co-host, Dominic Bussogno. Dominic, how are you? I'm great, Jordan. Uh, back on here for the first time in a little bit, so, so glad to be back on and looking forward to talking. And this will also mark the point where our podcast returns to its usual fortnightly uh, release um, every other Wednesday after we had uh, a few episodes through the throughout the Toulon tournament. And that's probably a good point to start, although we're going to talk about League of Football and how the season uh, has gone so far. We should discuss the Toulon tournament. It, it's over, and I think it's fair to say that we, as a nation, as Venezuela, well, I say we, Venezuela as a nation, definitely outperformed people's expectations from outside the country. But were you surprised, Dom? You know, I think I... Um, w- hoped that that sort of run would happen but I, I don't think that I thought that sort of run would happen I, I certainly had faith in that group to perform well uh, and to and to do themselves some justice uh, I did not necessarily foresee you know battling it out with France in the final and, and losing out really only by uh, you know a goal and obviously a red card and some some questionable calls that that played into all that but um yeah, I, I was I was very proud to, to see how well they performed. Uh, not just you know obviously some players that we knew would be performing well that are already in Europe, but the amount of guys that came straight out of uh, League of Football seasons to perform better than pretty much everyone else playing in the tournament um, was really phenomenal. I think it's a it's a huge um, reminder to the world to pay attention to the talent in this league, and uh, you know very. F- very few ways to do that better than to basically show up, you know, all these very successful countries, you know, in front of a crowd full of scouts. Yeah, and that was the the big thing about this generation, getting that opportunity to be seen firsthand in Europe by by clubs, by scouts, by by European football fans as well. Obviously, it was an accessible time for, for Europe, whereas arguably Liga Football and Sudamericana and the Bertorres games aren't, unless you're, you know, a diehard or a South American football fan uh, in Europe. So that was... It was great to see, and also Telasco Segovia, one of the Venezuelans that still plays in Liga Fútbol, uh, winning the Player of the Tournament award, and Andres Ferro getting the the Independent Player of the Tournament award as well from from one of the, the sponsors. Uh, so that that was it was great to see him, like you touched upon, disappointing the manner of which Venezuela lost out in the final. Uh, I think in this, you know, arguably France um, were a better team throughout the tournament, but it, it's always a shame when when questionable refereeing um, ends up being one of the narratives, uh, and it certainly was. But it's, it's great to see the amount of players that are now, Venezuelan players that are now being spoken of um, in social media by, by scouts, by, by analysts, and, you know, supposedly getting some attention. It'll be interesting to see whether, although the Venezuelan transfer window closes um, in the next seven days, the European windows have only just opened or just opening and, and will remain for another six weeks. So it'll be interesting to see if any of those young players earn uh, good moves off the back of this tournament. But let's get into the main topic of today's podcast, which is looking at Liga for Bay so far. As I said, we are at the midpoint and it's fair to say there are some notable surprises. I'm going to give my three surprises, uh, be they negative or, or positive. Um, and then we we'll go to your three, Dom. Uh, for me, my three surprises um, are Metropolitanos topping the table um, at the midpoint. As I said in our season preview, I wondered where the goals were going to come from and whether they were going to be able to continue their sort of year-on-year improvement under Hazo Maria Moore. And, well, they are. They're top of the table. Um, but we will get into whether that can continue later. My second surprise... Uh, is the performance of Caracas Football Club. Um, as we are recording this, uh, Caracas are not even in the top half of the table. They are 10th. Um, they are just five points uh, from the bottom 
and 11 points from the top. Uh, so a top four finish, which would guarantee Popola Vertigores football next season, is only six points away, but it feels much further uh, based on recent performances. And my third surprise of the season so far, taking you from the top of the table through the middle and to the bottom, is that it is not uh, it is not Zulia that are bottom of the table. Zulia, in fact, higher than Caracas in the table, currently ninth. It is Uceve. Sadly, because it is a team that I have, and I think you as well, Dominic, have a soft spot for. So they are my three surprises, just to introduce you to the state of play, listeners. And Dominic, what would you say your three surprises are? And sorry if I have nabbed one, two, or all three of yours. No, that's all right. You know, I, I think one thing that's really great about the season is that there truly are a lot of interesting storylines that are developing almost almost every slot on the uh, on the whole table. Uh, I'll I'll start out with an. an a team that I think is underperforming, that people have grown to expect strong seasons from is, is Deportivo La Guaira. Uh, certainly not having a horrible season. Uh, you know, they're in eighth as we record uh, and, and certainly are, are able to return to those upper spots uh, where they were for a period at the start of the season. You know, that's a, a, a side that this season has uh, lost some pieces, brought some different pieces in, uh, some young guys, Bolivar, Paz, uh, Herrera. Uh, many of which uh, are coming out of the United States, oddly enough, uh, through loans or, or through college in Herrera's uh, case. Uh, and, you know, there's been periods of times where it seems like that bet has worked out and they've gotten goals. Bolivar has had a, a relatively good season statistically. Um, but then they have these these long periods. Of, you know, they just got out of a streak of, oh, gosh, I believe it was 10 or 11 games in all competitions without a win. Uh, that that did include some Sudamericana matches, which they did quite poorly in, um, and so you know, I think it's a complicated side to read. Obviously, this is a side that just a few years ago won the league, uh, and since then has consistently been, uh, you know, more or less sort of that top four, top six playoff, whatever kind of team, whatever uh, verbiage you want to use, uh, and uh, it doesn't quite seem like they're getting there this year as as other teams show up. Uh, the the next team I'll jump to is uh, Estudiantes de Merida, who are are now under the uh, the reign of uh, Leo uh, Gonzalez, who I believe had not taken over really the last time we did a podcast mentioning them. Um, he's uh, you know this, when he came in there was a, there was a bump in form and then kind of a drop and now we're seeing kind of a bump again and Estudiantes are our sixth place as we talk. Uh, I recall the first time we talked about them for this season on a podcast. Uh, they were, you know, informally in a relegation battle. They they weren't expected to ever really have to deal with relegation, but they were in that area, and uh, they've they've really flipped the script. And you know, they're they're only two points out of the the fourth place spot that would put them into that Libertadores battle and that title battle. So, really impressive shift from them. Uh, and then uh, uh, my third one will be uh, Academia Puerto Cabello which is very in tandem, actually, with Zulia, as, as you mentioned. Those two club storylines for this season are, are kind of one giant one, being that uh, Puerto Cabello fired uh, Francisco Perlo as, as their manager after, you know, what, what, whatever it was, a month or two uh, in charge, which had them mid-table uh, or thereabouts. Uh, and then, obviously, he's joined Zulia, and they've done very well, while Puerto Cabello are, are now 14th, uh, three points away from the relegation spot. Uh, that, that's not a team that necessarily people expect to, to do especially well, but it is very interesting to see a team start relatively well. They got some points off some big teams. They were getting results at home. Uh, see them make a questionable decision in terms of the, of the head coach or the manager, and then see him go to another team and clearly show his quality while, while theirs seems to sink away a little bit. Uh, They've they've brought in the the reigning champion manager and uh, 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 Tuliano, but uh, or Tolisano, excuse me. Uh, but um, it, it you know it's it's still unclear whether or not that's going to work out and whether or not that's exactly what they needed. They they've gotten some positive results recently, but again, three points away from relegation. And briefly, I think in the last uh, match week, they were in the relegation spot uh, with a game in hand after Usabe had had won uh, against Caracas. So that's a team that it's not necessarily that the expectations were any specific spot on the table, but the way their season has gone about has been very strange. Uh, and it's very interesting to see how, how the rest of their year goes. 
Yeah, when you were when you were talking, I was picking up the the stats on Deportivo Laguara's winless run because, um, yeah, it was it was notable, um, not just for for its length, but it actually made history. It was the the longest winless streak in the history of Deportivo Laguara, including their their predecessor Real Sport before the takeover and the name change. Ten games without victory in the league, sixteen including the Copa Sudamericana, uh, dating back into March. Um, so it really was. Uh, a really a, a really long winless streak and on the flip side as we are halfway through the season um the longest unbeaten streak of the season so far um which was broken uh was carabobo with uh, 11 games they are surprisingly we haven't neither of us have mentioned yet and they're definitely worth five minutes of our time um later in the podcast and then another unfortunate bit of history um has been made this season and touching upon one of my surprises caracas uh, they're currently on their worst run in a Liga for their regular season since 2016. Um, that was when they lost to Carabobo, drew to Portuguesa and Dams, Deportivo and Zuatagui no longer exist, um, and lost to JBL, Zulia and Estudiantes de Caracas, another team currently not operating. The head coach at the time was replaced at the end of the season. This is a nice segue, or well, maybe nice isn't the right word, but this is certainly a segue to discuss the situation at Caracas. Francesco Stefano is the head coach of Caracas, new this season, replacing a legend of Venezuelan football um, and football at Caracas Football Club, Noel Chita San Vicente. Do you see Stefano staying? Um, and do you, uh, as, a, as an outsider, as a football fan, blame Stefano for uh, what is a horrible run and a horrible season. And to put it into um, context, they were last season's runners-up. Uh, they reached the final four the season before. And the season before that, 2019, they were champions. As it stands, they're 10th in a 16-team league uh, with only four wins uh, from 17 games. Yeah, you know, this is a complicated one. I, I think on the one hand, a huge factor in all this that is sort of in the background is the fact that San Vicente, of course, ended up going to Zamora, who are having a great season, right? Yeah. And so I don't think that helps Stefano's optics, that the guy he's replaced is somewhere else in the league now uh, in third place currently, a couple points off the top. Uh, and I think that does provide some context of, the, as you said, the shoes he stepped into are very difficult ones to fill, uh, which I suppose means that he deserves... Uh, uh, some credit or some space in that conversation. Uh, at the same time, the, the performances simply haven't been good enough. I mean, dropping, uh, what, two games this season against the against Uceve, who are bottom of the table, is not acceptable. Although, for what it's worth, San Vicente basically did the same thing last season with Lala. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not good enough. Uh, you see other teams who are struggling, quote-unquote, struggling, Based on last year's optics, you know, even Tatira are not having necessarily the season they would have liked to have, but they're still fourth. You know, they're still still finding points, and they're still not far from uh, potentially following up with a second title. Uh, and I wouldn't. I, I think the problem in terms of whether or not he would get replaced. Uh, one, obviously, we have a lot of season left, but at the end of the season, is you know, who do they find that is enough of an upgrade to be worth the process? Um, obviously because of the league that we're talking about, there's only so many necessarily people that you're going to be drawing in. So, uh, you know, I, I think that might stop them from pursuing a, a replacement, but he's clearly not managing quality pieces the way his predecessor did. You know, there's a lot of turnover in this squad. There are, there are changes, but there's also a lot of turnover. It's still a lot of the same guy. Or same guys, rather. You still got Aquignola. You still got all the youth prospects. You got a similar back line. Um, I don't think enough people have left for that to become an excuse. So uh, I, I don't think it'd be a bad idea to replace him in the offseason. I'm not sure it will happen because I think it might just be logistically difficult for them to, to do in a way that will actually benefit them. Yeah, we we see a lot of we see a lot of flux and a lot of change in Venezuelan football at the end of, of every season. Um, managerial changes, player changes. It's quite a fluid league. Uh, like it's internal, it's internal environment. Um, certainly more than you know. I grew up watching the the Premier League and then paying secondary attention to to La Liga. But it certainly feels that there is a lot more internal movement year on year. 
um, in Liga Futebol. But when you look at available managers for a possible mid-season replacement, Martin Carrillo is the only name um, to me, really, um, that stands out. Uh, but he's still a young coach and a lot of people, I don't, I don't see it like this just because I don't have that level of, of experience, perhaps, um, or far back knowledge of, of Liga Futebol. Um, you know, going 10, 20 years and um, like that. But some people think that maybe Stefano's struggling because of the, the the size of Caracas. It's too big a job for him to take on. But this is a player uh, manager that has managed abroad. He's managed in Colombia's Premier, uh, Primera División. He's taken Zulia to a Copa Sudamericana quarter final. Um, you know, it's not his first job. It's not his first job at a big club in Venezuela either. Um, whether you call Zulia a big club or not, uh, he's undeniably managed a big club in Deportivo Tatra, Caracas' rivals. Um, so it's a difficult one. But the two teams that I said that we'd revisit is where I think we'd go next, Metropolitanos and Carabobo. Before we do so, and we'll start with Metro, I'll just run down the league title in full. Um, at the top, Metropolitanos with 31 points, closely followed in the top four by Monagas on 30, Zamora on 29 and Deportivo Tatra on 26. From 5th to 12th, which at the end of the season, regular season, will be the teams that will compete for Sudamericana in a two-group format playoff. Carabobo on 25 points. Going down to 12th is Mineros on 19 points. So six points separating. And those teams are Carabobo, Estudiantes de Merida, Portuguesa, Deportivo La Guaira, Zulia, Caracas, Amanos Comaneras, and Mineros. Then we have Aragua in 13th, Puerto Cabello in 14th, Deportivo Lara in 15th, and Uceve in 16th. Only one team will get relegated this season. So the three teams above whoever finishes last, their season will end prematurely with everyone else going on to either play in the championship round or the Copa Sudamericana playoff round. Metropolitanos, Dominic, at the start of the season, like I said earlier, I wondered where the goals were going to come from. That was very much answered by Robinson Flores. But now I have been given the salvation of being able to make the same point again and perhaps not lose as much face as I deserve to. Robinson Flores has gone in the second half of the season. Where are the goals going to come from for them to stay first? Yeah, it's a serious problem. And, and you know, you even see right away, the, the last game they played as we recorded just a couple of days ago was that that home 2-0 two, two loss to Puerto Cabello, who were expected to lose that game quite handily. Uh, you know, I'm not sure where the goals come from. And I don't know if they're sure where the goals come from. They certainly have plenty of players who have a goal or two this season. But it's, it's a lot of one-offs. It's a lot of a guy that scored one time. Uh, Flores was really the only consistent uh, uh, front man that they were finding. You know, I, I see, I'm looking at the, the score list here, and I see uh, Araujo has, has four goals. That's, you know, that's something to, uh, of note. But otherwise, it's been very inconsistent. Uh, you know, this team definitely, you know, we talked, I recall we did an episode a while back about uh, the teams that were originally in the Sudamericana. And... Um, you know, Metro has clearly benefited from that tournament ending. Their form has, you know, picked up, especially as the closing stages of that tournament came and they kind of understood their fate in that. Um, they picked up a lot of points. But if you're going to be moving key pieces halfway through the season, that's going to be very hard to manage. And they have, I mean, a laundry list of teams that are waiting for them to, to draw or lose another game so they can hop them. Uh, I, 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 was very interested to see what they could do with this top spot that they had earned, but already I'm very uh, uh, pessimistic about their ability to hold on to it, like you've, like your question points out. Because of the way this transfer window has gone for them, I'm not even sure where they're getting goals. And I, their d defense isn't good enough just to clean sheet every game. Uh, and so I do think they might be in a little bit of trouble. And then after Metropolitanos, we have... In the, in the top four, Monagas, who have led uh, for much of the, the first half of the season, now just a point behind after they did win their last game, but previous to that, losing three on the bounce. That re and in that time, Metropolitanos winning three on the bounce really turned the tables. And then Zamora, who um, are on 29 points with eight draws, only two defeats. There's no team in the league that have lost fewer than and Carabobo, the fewest on two and Deportivo Tatra on, on 26. And you touched upon their season not being 
up to scratch considering they're the reigning champions and perhaps Copa Libertadores had an effect on that because they they were fighting for a qualification to the next round until the very end. Now they've dropped into the Copa Sudamericana. Um, so they still have two big fixtures left in continental football. But just outside that top four is the team that we wanted to speak to uh, speak about next, Carabobo. Their situation has been impressive. But if you look at the win-draw-loss column, they've drawn 10 of their games. Uh, no team has drawn as many. And they've only, I say only, uh, considering they're only a point outside the top four, they've only won five of their 17 games. So less than a third. The, the win percentage is, is actually less than a third. Um, I personally don't use win percentages as a, a good indicator. Like I know, um, I wouldn't say analysts do, but certainly um, TV companies, broadcasters like to put up a manager's win ratio. I would, I think a uh an unbeaten ratio is is better um you know using a ratio of games undefeated the wins plus the draws uh and that's certainly where Carabobo have been strong like i said only two defeats um the the fewest in the league but they have with the wins the same amount of wins as mineros who are 12th and were in the bottom three for much of the first half of the season it is the fact that they've been hard to beat which has got them to where they are um before their second loss of the season um, which was only uh, a couple of games ago, they'd only been behind for all of three minutes all season. That that first loss came in second half, at the beginning of second half stoppage time and was an own goal uh, and a bit of a mistake from, from Claudio Fraga. It is, it's the organisation of new head coach Kike Garcia, which I don't think surprises you um, or me. But again... They have had a lot of their goals come from one player, Kevin Viveros, like Metro with Robinson Flores. The only difference is it looks certain or almost certain that Viveros will remain at Carabobo until the end of the season. And his goals are going to prove vital. Do you think Carabobo have what it takes to sneak into the top four? I think it's very possible. I think, you know, as you're pointing out, Carabobo are, uh, and, and this shouldn't be surprising given, you know, we did a whole podcast about how this team was kind of using this like money ball style of, of build this is very much like a system team this is a team that thrives off of having a way they play uh, more so than having a large list of all-stars of the league that being said they have a very good roster but uh you know you see they have two losses this season both very close ones obviously you mentioned the the Monodos, uh loss which was created by an own goal in, in extra time and then their most recent loss, which is against uh, Deportivo Lara, was was a one nil late goal from Lara uh, uh, at uh, at Carabobo at Valencia. Um, so you know they've they're incredibly hard to beat. Those games were probably going to be draws, not necessarily wins for them if the bad luck hadn't occurred. And so you still have actually even more so of that problem that you could have twelve draws. Um, I think that it is entirely possible for them to jump into maybe a fourth place or a third place. I, I don't think we'll see them manage to to climb all the way up to the top two um, because they're simply not picking up points the way some of these other teams are. But they certainly have enough quality that if they did sneak into that, that top four tournament that comes after the regular season, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I do think they need help from... Uh, teams like Tatira or maybe Zamora to have them drop in form for periods of time if they want that. Otherwise, if they were to be in that uh, uh, Sudamericana qualification tournament from uh, 5th to 12th, I think they are easily a favorite team to do well in that uh, because, again, they have a lot of quality, a lot of quality in leadership, a lot of quality in system. But... Yeah, they need to find wins. They need, you know, it's funny to say they need to find goals. They have one of the best goal scorers in the league right now, but they need to find goals from other players or just get an immense more goals out of uh, Viveros. Uh, they have to do one or the other because right now they're simply not picking up enough points to, to have particular hopes of, of, of a title this season, which I'm sure they would like to get. Um, so yeah, you know they're one of those teams. And there's a couple of teams around them. Like Estudiantes is another team right below them. That it's 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 possible for them to have a huge season, uh, but they really need to put the puzzle together soon 
they need to figure some things out very soon if they want to actually stay close to the rest of that top four in, in the race. Otherwise, you're going to see a little bit of a gap develop, I think. Yeah, and it's the it, it's their defensive solidity. It's only Zamora, the team that have lost, you know, the least amount alongside Parabobo that right. have let in fewer. They've only let in 11 to Parabobo's 12. And uh, it's been impressive how Parabobo have, have organizationally been set up under Kike. And no surprise, really, he, he won the Panamanian League with Tauro last season. And the, the two seasons before that, he consecutively got Aragua, which on paper was far from a brilliant squad packed with star names. Uh, into the group stages of, of Copa Sudamericana for two two consecutive seasons. And I fancy Carabobo to, to do that again if they finish outside the top four. If they do finish out the top four, um, the the way the Copa Sudamericana playoff is structured is the teams from five to 12th will be split into two groups of four and play each other twice. And the top two teams from uh, each group will then play the Copa Sudamericana playoffs at the beginning of next season, uh, with two of those four teams guaranteed a place in the group stages. At the bottom of the table, or towards the bottom of the table, um, there's there's certainly something to discuss in Usebe's, uh, you know, picking up the bottom. But firstly, a team that's managed to escape um, what looked like a certain relegation fight, Zulia, who are nowhere near there now, they're ninth, um, and, and look fine. They're one of only two teams in the league at present that can boast uh, being unbeaten for at least five games. And Fran Perlo was probably an unexpected gift at the start of the season. He started the season newly appointed at Academia Protocolo, but their decision, their loss is certainly Zulia's gain. What's impressed you the most about the turnaround that's been happening in Maracaibo, Dominic? Yeah, it's an interesting one. You know, I, I think one aspect of Zulia's roster that worked out very well for Perlo's arrival, which of course was not planned, was the fact that Zulia signed quite a few Panamanian players right before the start of the season. And, uh, I, you know, I think some, some of who he had coached and some of who he hadn't, but he'd obviously played against uh, and seen play in various contexts. Uh, and, you know, I think that played out very well for them. You look at uh, uh, you look at uh, uh, Guido Ruiz uh, and who has eight goals for them from Panama, uh, and whose form, by the way, dramatically improved when Perlo came in. I think he had one or two goals before Perlo came in, and since then he scored six or seven of his eight, uh, including a hat trick in their first uh, win, uh, which was against Mineros. Uh, so, you know, he, he's found what he needs in those Panamanian signings from the off season, which, you know, obviously you need to get something out of when you're bringing in players. Uh, but he's also clearly done, had a positive impact on the youth talent that this roster is very much built around. Uh, the parade, uh, parade aces, the, uh, the, uh, Ramirez is the same own Ramirez. Uh, he's gotten goals out of them. He's gotten, uh, leadership performances out of them. He's gotten considerable amount of minutes out of them. And he's just, you know, I don't think Zulia are in a situation where they're going to climb much further up the table than they are currently. But he's clearly found a way to get this mixture of young and foreign talent to work together to uh, be more defensively stout. Um, it was noted to me uh, that, uh, and I did notice to a degree, that Perlo shifted to you know, a more consistent back four when he came in. They were kind of playing a, a three to slash five system before that. Yeah. Um, and that seems to have worked out better. Players seem to be able to manage the spaces they have to manage uh, in a more effective way. Uh, and obviously the goals are coming in. So, you know, it, it's really a, a remarkable, it's a remarkable endorsement of Francisco Perlo's ability, to be perfectly honest. Um, and, and again, it leaves question marks around the fact that he, uh, he joined because he was fired a couple months into it, another job. But, um, yeah, it's been it's been a phenomenal turnaround, and I, you know I I uh, imagine it uh, it means quite a bit for the the fans that have to stand outside of a wall to watch their uh, their team play it this season because of stadium availability as well. Yeah, uh, I, I I imagine they appreciate the effort that's being shown, and that's the other thing is you know when on the occasion that I watch a Sulia game, depending on which of us is covering which game. Uh, 
their their matches show an immense amount of effort. And obviously, every professional athlete shows effort, but certain some teams are just designed to put a little more sweat into the game than others, and uh, they they very much fight for for every point they get. You know, you look at their late uh, comeback in that two two draw against Puerto Cabello at Puerto Cabello, who they beat in four one the week before. They got a penalty and a free kick goal in the last like ten minutes. They were two nil down, and they figured it out and they got the goals. Uh, teams destined for relegation don't find don't figure out those games. Teams destined to get out of relegation figure out those games. And Perlo's found the way to communicate that to the players, the way to get that out of them, which is uh, phenomenal. It's what most clubs have to dream about, and very few get to see. Uh, so credit to him. He, I mean, he's yeah, he's completely changed that team. So we probably agree that Zulia have, although it's you know far from well, I'd say it's 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 premature to say that they've most most definitely escaped to relegation battle because there's still 13 games left. But I I would be surprised if they got drawn back into it. Usave are definitely in it, bottom of the table with with 15, and by the grace of format, only one team is going down. Who else do you think needs to to worry about about relegation? I think my, my feeling is that Deportivo Lara are, aren't going to be in danger from this. If yeah. nothing else, because they just have so much different quali- different qualities and quality in their roster, which admittedly in this last transfer window has changed quite a bit. Uh, but, but still, I mean, it, they have such a strong group, more or less top to bottom, that I, I just don't see... Uh, uh, them getting relegated, you see them pull out results like that 1-0 win against Carabobo on the road and, and that sort of thing. And if you get enough of those, you're just not going to get relegated when there's only one team going down. Uh, I worry about Ac- Academia Puerto Cabello because they just, they you know, we, we've seen this in previous years. There's even been years where they've been exceptionally strong and then they'll get into that crucial leg of the season whether it's in recent years, it's been like the hexagonal B or the, you know that kind of stuff. And uh, there's just a serious drop in form when it really matters. And uh, I, I, I do worry that if one of those hits them before the season is over, because the, the gap is so narrow from, from bottom to you know 13th place, uh, one, one of those for a couple of weeks could be enough to drop them back down. I mean, you even saw briefly, uh, the last match week, briefly they were bottom. Uh, after Useve won a game. And Useve have kind of stepped up here and there and are getting results again. Um, they didn't necessarily have a uh, new manager bump right away, but but they've found that a delayed bump, I guess, that uh, they're they're using now. Um, so I think it's going to be tough. I think the, the you know, what, and, and this is sort of more from my like, sentimental guy that writes about soccer side of things, but um, one thing that, you know, Useve doesn't have that might bite them in the back that these other teams have is that, you know, Useve do not have what, you know, a, a consistent fan base uh, the way that these other teams do. And you do wonder if that might, you know, some of these other teams, I don't know if Aragua's roster is better than Useve's, but I do know that there's going to be people at that stadium every game screaming for them to survive. Uh, and, you know, that, that in every league, yeah, I'm sure, we're, I mean, we can probably both think of examples even from the Premier League or the Championship. Teams teams that have the right kind of support, that can push them over the line. I do think that's something that Useve not having will be a problem for them. Um, you know, you, particularly Lara and, and Puerto Cabello have very uh, avid fan bases this year, very loud fan bases this year. So, um, yeah. I, and, they're playing, I, I, and they're playing in much, much smaller stadiums. That too, uh, yes. You know, Useve also have the additional problem, uh, if you like, of playing at El Olimpico, which is like 25,000 capacity right. stadium, and Uceve games are barely scraping 500. Right, right. And so I, I just wonder if that might be a problem for them that's going to push all those other squads to just get a couple extra draws, an extra win out of effort, um, particularly at home, that Uceve won't be getting. So, uh, you know, in my opinion right now, Uceve are the team that go down. Uh, that just feels like that's what's going to happen. Uh, if I had to pick one of the other three, 
I think I would put it on Puerto Cabello only because that just in general, year after year, that roster is just very in flux, very inconsistent, very volatile. And it's it's difficult. And I, you know, last season there was some drama at the end of the year in terms of people leaving early and stuff. Uh, so if any of that comes back this season, I could very easily push them over the edge. Uh, so they, they would be the team that I'd be most concerned about. So we've touched upon the top four. We've touched upon relegation candidates. And we've spoken of the teams drifting uh, in the middle. Do you think there is anything from this first the half, first half of the season that um, may may tip off you towards a surprise for the second half of the season? Maybe there's something in this transfer market that's caught your eye or a turn of form of one of the clubs. But if you were to try and make a, a bold claim about the second half of the season, what would yours be? I will help you out by sort of illustrating with my own. I, for example, think Amanos Colmenares could potentially end up caught in a relegation fight. I don't think they're going to go down, but I think that will be because there's only one relegation spot. I think if this was like most seasons where where three teams go down, they could be in real trouble. I'm, I'm worried about their drop-off. They haven't won in at least five games uh, and they, they don't seem to have addressed that, in my opinion, um, in the trance market. Players have come in, but I wouldn't say it's players that are going to turn their season around. That's a very good point, and, and I definitely see what you're saying. You know, there's been a drop in form, uh, and they're not that many points off. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess I'll do one that kind of is more at the top, uh, just to change things up. I, I, you know, I kind of talked about this with the, we talked about Carlo Bobo, but I think just out of inconsistencies, uh, with players in the roster, having guys sometimes not available because of international duty, uh, 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 you know, certainly a player or two that's being looked at to be bought. I have a feeling that Tatira don't make the top four. Not because they finish 10th or something, but I think yeah, they yeah. end up finishing 5th or 6th. Yeah. I think something could happen. There's just too mm -hmm. much, in, you know, we saw particularly in the Libertadores, the inconsistencies of that group. They still have to deal with the Sudamericana, albeit it might just be two games. Uh, but it might not be. And uh, I just, I don't know if they are able to pull. There's enough pressure from the rest of that. You know, obviously you have your Caro Bobos, Estudiantes could potentially pull up. You could have Caracas find, you know, pull things together, pull back up the table. I I just, you know, for all the, and, and maybe I, I'm sure that this is on social media, but for all the questions about Stefano, I think, uh, Pajares has not been amazing and uh, I think there's plenty of questions to be had about him too it's just the math doesn't quite show it yet um, so yeah my my my, my uh, shock prediction or whatever my shock theory will just be that I'm very I'm not convinced that Tachira have secured that top four at all okay no I, I think it's a it's a very very valid point and I think their recruitment at the beginning of the season um was yeah it was I, i've been told before like they were tatra like they go for the big names and whilst they did do that i don't think they balanced it out over the you know the pitch and they signed a lot of wingers a lot of forward players um and whilst they haven't particularly been awful defensively like there's a lot of imbalance in that squad and um a lot of the a lot of rotation has to happen to keep a lot of attacking players uh happy but that is the perfect place to wrap up this podcast uh, there you go. My surprise, Amanos Comaneras continuing to slip in the second half of the season. Dominic thinks maybe Deportivo Tatra don't finish top four. The big questions, where are Metropolitanos' games going to come from in the second half of the season? Can Carabobo add some three points to their regular return of one? And finally, can Usebe drag themselves off of the bottom? This has been the Fave English Podcast. Dominic, thank you for joining me today. Yes, thanks for having me. It was great to be back. And until next time, bye-bye.